Hi, this is Mike Purcell, voice of the Tomorrowland Transit Authority People Mover. As we approach the Tomorrowland Transit Authority station, our Grand Circle Tour is coming to an end, but not to a stop, because you're listening to the Living the Dream podcast with your host, Krista Joy from Disneyways.com. Hold on tight, because today's journey leads to tomorrow's dream. And get ready for the Living the Dream podcast. A long-awaited feature documentary on the making of Walt Disney World opens the 2019 Orlando Film Festival on October 17, 2019. Walt Disney, Master of Dreamers from director Tony Cortese has been selected to open the Orlando Film Festival. And tickets are available now on the Orlando Film Festival website. Here to tell us more about it is author and Disney historian, best-selling author of my two favorite books, The Wisdom of Walt and Beyond the Wisdom of Walt. He also teaches the only accredited college course on the history of Disneyland and believes the Disney parks teach us some of life's greatest lessons as long as you know their history. You can learn all about them at thewisdomofwalt.com. Jeff Barnes, welcome to the show. Well, hi, Krista, and I uh, want to give a shout-out to all of the listeners, and uh, thanks for having me on today. Yeah, it's our pleasure. Thank you for coming back. It's been a while since we've had you here at Living the Dream Podcast. We're thrilled to have you back. <laughs> you know, um, I was thinking about this before uh, you know we started the interview. Um, you know, for me, this is where it all began. Uh, the last time I was on, uh, we were recording at Walt Disney World out on Seven Seas Lagoon, uh, July 4th, 2015. And that was actually the very first interview I ever did with and for the Wisdom of Walt. And uh, A, thanks for doing that. B, thanks for having me on again. And C, uh, for getting us started on what has really been an incredible journey these last four plus years. What a journey you've had. I know you're just speaking all over the world and just influencing lives everywhere. And it, it was really my honor to be the place where it all started. And you never forgot that. So thank you, Jeff, for remembering us. <laughs> So let's talk about this movie. How exciting. Did you ever dream you were going to be an actor on the big screen? Well, I, I don't know that I'm an actor, per se. <laughs> I'm really a contributor. Yeah. But, um, you know, it's sort of funny how uh, dreams go, which I know is the theme of, of, of this podcast. You know, you get started on something, and I, I tell people all the time, you know, the dream business, uh, one plus two never equals three, and A plus B never equals C. Uh, it, it's a lot like riding, um, you know, a roller coaster in the dark, i.e. Space Mountain. Um, you can't really anticipate or know in advance where the twists and turns are going to take you. And, um, you know, quite frankly, it was it was very random. I, um, I, I met a woman who was part of a travel agency who was doing a sponsorship at D23 back in 2015, and we stayed in contact off and on over the next several months. And uh, on a random Sunday morning, she sent me an article about a guy uh, who had quit his job in New York City and was leaving his hometown in Connecticut to live his dream and moved down to Walt Disney World. And he had just released uh, a, a video montage uh, of that, uh, of, of what it meant to you know follow your dreams and how Disney World is, quote unquote, the place where dreams come true. And so I immediately reached out to Tony. Well, we struck up a friendship, and I don't know that we ever make a trip to Orlando, which is which is quite frequently these days. I don't know that we ever make a trip to Orlando anymore, that we don't see Tony, uh, meet up with Tony. And somewhere along the way, you know, he transitioned from the project that he had just finished to doing this new documentary on... Walt Disney, Walt Disney World, and, you know, specifically Epcot. Somehow along the way, in terms of our friendship and our relationship, he trusted me enough to be one of the contributors. I, I can tell you, um, you know, Tony has worked unbelievably hard, not just in making this film, but making it just unbelievable and incredible and awesome. I was honored to have the opportunity to watch a final version back in June and I knew pieces and parts of it, not just what I had contributed, but other uh, pieces and parts that others had contributed. But wow, 
wow, was I blown away when I when I had a chance to see the final version. Yes, and I was privileged to have lunch with you and Tony. I think it was in California. Even though Tony and I both live here, the first time I ever met him was out in California with you. And I remember having lunch and just listening to you guys was just unbelievable. Going back and forth, he's I think he's one of the few people that can keep up with you on the Walt Disney history. <laughs> Yeah, and things like that. So that was a that was a fun time for me. Now, yeah, what- well, like a lot of us, I mean, he's he's passionate about Disney. Um, he loves Walt. He loves the parks. And um, what he really wants to do is uh, have that emotional connection with uh, so many other Disney fans and get them to understand and get them to appreciate you know the backstory and the history and everything that went into creating the place or places that we all love so very much. Mm -hmm. So what do you think sets this film apart from all the films out there about Walt Disney? There's been so many through the years. Well, for me, um, it's it's a couple of things. Uh, One, it's not a biography of of Walt. It doesn't, you know, trace his story or tell his life from, from beginning to end. But instead, it, it really focuses on, you know, sort of the ethos of what Walt wanted to accomplish in the parks and then specifically in Central Florida, especially by way of Epcot. And, you know, living here in Southern California and being surrounded by Disneyland and, you know, doing the Disneyland history course, I can say um, it, it appears to me that there's a lot more out there when it comes to the history of Disneyland. And that makes sense. I mean, it was the first park, and it's the only park that Walt ever actually walked in. And so um, it's just natural that, you know, when it comes to history, you know, Disneyland gets the vast majority of attention. Um, I would argue that Tony has finally done for Walt Disney World what so many have already done for Disneyland. And so if um, if you're a fan of Walt Disney World, if you're a fan of Walt, and if you're really curious about um, the original dream for Central Florida, which of course was all about Epcot, the experimental prototype community at the Mar, you're not going to want to miss this film because Tony absolutely nails what all of the original dream was about. Wow, for you to say that, that's a that's a fantastic endorsement, I think. Um, so this film is going to debut at eight o'clock, October 17th at the Cobb Plaza Cinema Cafe on Orange Avenue, right in downtown Orlando, right where I grew up. So that's exciting. And the screening is going to be preceded by a red carpet event at 630. They also have more than 250 other films through October 24th. So Jeff, tell us about the event. What do you know? I I know you're going to be attending some or all of it. Why should people go to this? Um, so the Orlando Film Festival is um, a once-a-year event that film fans don't want to miss anyway. But then secondly, um, you know, we, we were just hoping that the film would get shown in the film festival. Um, never in our wildest dreams could we possibly imagine that it would get picked to be the premier film. And that really is a reflection of the quality of the work that Tony has done. But I think secondly, it really is the story of what Walt wanted to accomplish in Central Florida and the way in which that dream transformed Orlando. Mm. And so the film festival recognized not just the quality of the film, but also its importance and its significance. And so if you're a resident of Central Florida and are a fan of Disney, you're not going to want to miss this opportunity. And I hear from folks every single day, um, how can I see the film? Where can I see the film? When can I see the film? And the only answer right now is the Orlando Film Festival. Mm -hmm. Now, after that, we are working on a lot of different distribution deals. Um, Obviously, we're hoping for Disney+. Plus. Netflix would be an awesome option as well. But none of that is worked out at this point. And so the only thing I can say to folks is if you want to see this film and you want to see it sooner rather than later, you need to get to the Orlando Film Festival. 
Yes, October 17th. And then the Orlando Sentinel wrote that they will also be showing it again at 645 on October 24th. So I don't know. Correct. Yeah, okay. So that's that's still a thing. You can you can do that. And there's also tickets available at the box office. I want to mention to everybody. Um, so this is exciting. There's. I wonder, do you have any idea like how many people might come to this event on the 17th? Well, I, I, I think they're expecting, you know, hundreds. I don't know exactly how large the theater is, but, you know, the Orlando Film Festival is an up-and-coming event in the world of film festivals. Uh, it becomes more and more popular with each passing year. And uh, I, I think having the opportunity to premiere a film that is going to be so near and dear to the hearts of the people who live in Orlando, um, this is going to be a very popular premiere, and a, and a hot ticket in Orlando the night of the 17th. Yes, absolutely. And it's got to be exciting for you to know that you're going to be in the very same film that is featuring Bob Gurr, Richard Sherman, Raleigh Crump. <laughs> I mean, could you have ever in a million years imagined you'd be on the list with these guys? How exciting. You know, it, it is kind of crazy. I'm not going to lie. You... Um, you know, you, you start out and, uh, you know, you follow your interest and you follow your passion. And for me, that meant, you know, reading as much about Walt and as much about the history of Disneyland as Walt Disney World as possible. Well, you can't possibly go down that road without hearing the names of, you know, Robert Sherman and Bob Gurr and Rolly Crump. And uh, over time, they become like gods to you because they helped make Walt's dream possible. And so the idea that I would ever you know, have a chance to meet those individuals, have a conversation with those individuals, interview those individuals, and now be in the film with those individuals, um, yeah, you, you, you kind of pinch yourself every day and ask yourself, is this real? Is this really happening? And the answer is yes, and it's going to happen the night of October 17th. So exciting. So can we go back, just in case people don't know, let's give them a little backstory. So Walt had this genius idea for Epcot, but it was never supposed to be a theme park. So can you kind of tell us the history a little bit? Yeah, so um, Walt was a starter. He, he wasn't a finisher per se. He, he brought in uh, people that he readily recognized as more talented than he was uh, to finish uh, a lot of the things that he started. And um, he hated sequels, never wanted to repeat himself. And uh, over and over again, he got asked, hey, build us a Disneyland over here, build us a Disneyland over there. And Walt went on record saying, no, there is never going to be another Disneyland. But by the late 50s and early 60s, he was already a little bit bored with what he had created in Southern California. And he was starting to get interested in urban planning. Well, fast forward to the 1964-65 World's Fair, uh, the Kennedy assassination. There were a lot of forces in play in the early 1960s that made Walt realize that what he was kicking around in his head or what he thought could be a progress city or a city of tomorrow, this wasn't just something that he was interested in. This was something that the United States and that the world ultimately needed. And so he made the decision to purchase 27,440 acres in Central Florida, um, land that is about 150 times the size of the original purchase for Disneyland. And his main goal for doing that was so that he could have the room and the space uh, to dream and build Epcot, again, the experimental prototype community of tomorrow. Um, he agreed to do um, Magic Kingdom, or what I like to refer to as Disneyland, 2.0, mainly because he knew he was going to need that revenue to finance the city. Plus, uh, he wanted complete control in Florida, and he was going to go to the state legislature and ask that he be given governmental control, which is extremely rare for a private company. And in return for all of that, the, the state of Florida said, we have no idea what you are going to do with this Epcot thing. But we know what Disneyland is, so if, if, you, if you give us that, then we'll be happy to, to, to give you the control. And, of course, um, you know, Walt, unfortunately, uh, dies of lung cancer six months before they ever break ground in Florida. 
But the night before he died, in his hospital bed at St. Joseph's, across the street from the studio in Burbank, Roy came to visit him, and the last conversation they ever had was Walt looking up at the ceiling tiles and describing to his older brother where everything on the property in Florida should go to include the monorail and Epcot. And so uh, when Walt died the next morning, Roy picked up the mantle, came out of retirement, and made sure that his final or last brother's dream and wish came to fruition, at least phase one, which of course was Magic Kingdom. Unfortunately, um, with Walt gone and then Roy passing away a couple of months after Magic Kingdom opened in 1951, Disney as a company was sort of lost both in terms of leadership but also in terms of what it meant to do this city of tomorrow, this progress city. Um, they were really lost as to how to create a city and run a city. And so ultimately, when they finally got around to Epcot, Disney did what it knew that it already knew how to do, which was a theme park. And I love Epcot, don't get me wrong. Um, but the Epcot that we enjoy and experience today isn't the Epcot that Walt dreamed of, and it certainly wasn't the vision that he laid out for us in the 1960s. We'll be right back with this interview after this brief message from our sponsor. Living the Dream Podcast is brought to you by Peter Alden's Kingdom Classics album, now available for digital download and physical CD. Click on our banner at DisneyWaste.com to get your copy. Oh, do what Pinocchio does. Always tell the truth because someday you'll run out of lies to tell. Peter Alden captures the classic feel of the golden age of rock and roll and fuses it into some of your favorite Disney classics. Sing with me now. Sha la 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 my oh my look at the boy to shine and gonna kiss the girl. Rave reviews from all major Disney influencers and talk show hosts are online now for Kingdom Classics. To the rock and roll is rock. Around the mouse, rock and roll around the house. Rock it, roll it, scream and shout. Hear more samples for free and order your copy of his album, Kingdom Classics, on CD or digital download today by visiting DisneyWays.com. Yeah, it's, it's a little bit different, but wow, the, the final result is, is amazing. And I was able to just enjoy it the other day with, with the Epcot Food and Wine Festival. But, you know, some people say that Celebration or maybe even Golden Oak is kind of reminiscent of maybe of sort of a little bit like what Walt would have originally imagined for Epcot. But I think uh, the end result that they got is is just as great, if, if not better. Yeah, I, I think the key word there is, a little bit, and I say that because, yeah, Celebration is its own town, and that's certainly what Walt wanted with Epcot, but you also have to remember, it wasn't just that Walt wanted to build a city or run a city, um, he wanted to do something unlike anything that had ever been done before, to include um, having it domed so that the climate would be perfect 365 days out of the year. But then secondly, he wanted to make major innovations in transportation. He wanted to include a green belt that would separate industry from residential. And then I think the final piece, and maybe the most important piece, is he was going to have all of these different companies that historically were in competition with each other. He, were going to, he was going to have them right next to each other uh, so that they could learn from each other so that they could value each other, so they could appreciate each other. And so it wasn't just about how we were going to live in the future, but it was also how we were going to learn in the future and how we were going to use each other's resources to go into the 21st century. Mm -hmm. And that never came to fruition in any way, shape, or form. <laughs> and for me, that's probably the greatest loss in terms of what Walt really wanted in that. 
Yeah, collaboration like that would, would be amazing, but yeah, unfortunately, yeah. it's pretty much unheard of. And, and, and I think that's the key word. Instead of competition, let's go with collaboration. Yes. And, um, you know, when they went out to get the partnerships for uh, the Epcot that did get built in 1982, even that was a significant struggle. And, um, you know, Walt not only knew what Epcot was supposed to be, not only could he have pulled it off, but I think most significantly, he could have gone into those companies, he could have gone into those corporations and sold them on this idea, and they would have gotten on board, and again, the world would have been a better place if Walt had lived another 10 or 15 years. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I would venture to guess that your second book, Beyond the Wisdom of Walt, would be a wonderful companion to this film, like a follow-up or <laughs> something they could get to, to go beyond. So talk about Beyond the Wiz. Let's talk about both of your books. They've been so crazy popular, but they're along the same lines of this film. So let's talk about those as well. Yeah, so the first book, which was released in 2015, um, is really a byproduct of my history of Disneyland class that I teach in Southern California. And uh, I never thought I would ever figure out how to write a book um, and I tell people all the time, the only thing more difficult than writing a book is actually selling it. And what I really couldn't anticipate was the book doing as well as it did to the point where I got numerous requests for a follow-up that focused on Walt Disney World. And my initial response was exactly like Walt's, no, I'm not ever writing another book. Um, you know, but eventually you, you figure out, hey, there's a market for this, and you know, Walt Disney World has a lot of great history, has a lot of great stories, has a lot of great lessons. And in, in researching Beyond the Wisdom Wall, I sort of came to the conclusion, Disneyland in Southern California may have been the dream, but Walt Disney World in Florida, that's the miracle. Because what they were able to pull off in what was almost unsellable swampland in the middle of Central Florida next to Orlando, which uh, was, was basically a nothing town back in the 1960s, that, that is nothing short of a miracle. And so in Beyond the Wisdom of Walt, we, we use a lot of lessons from Walt himself, but we tell stories from Walt Disney World. We tell stories from both the original Epcot and the Epcot that opened in 1982. But the real key to all of this is we're not just talking about Walt Disney or the leaders who followed him. We're not just talking about Disneyland or Walt Disney World. At the end of the day, we're talking about you and your dreams and your story and how you can use what you love at Disney as inspiration and motivation for seeing your own dreams come true. They've just both been incredibly popular. You know, the thing is... And I think Walt would agree. The public really dictated to you that they wanted another book, and you gave the public what they wanted. So I'm glad that you that you branched out and you did that, even though in the beginning you you were going to stop with the one book. I think Walt would have been he would have done the same thing. So I'm glad that you did that. <laughs> yeah, and, and the next step now is I get asked almost every day, is there going to be a third book? Right. And um, you know, I would love to finish the Wisdom Wall out as a trilogy. And the natural follow-up, of course, is beyond, uh, not beyond the Wisdom Wall, but the worldwide Wisdom Wall, mm -hmm. which would focus on the international parks and the cruise ships. But uh, between where we are today and where we'll ultimately be with that trilogy, um, we do continue to create brand new content by way of the Wisdom of Wall blog. And so if any of your listeners already have the book or books but aren't getting the blog, they're missing out on new content and again, free content. And if any of your listeners uh, aren't interested in purchasing a book, but they would like some weekly inspiration and motivation, all they have to do is go to the wisdomofwalt.com, click the blog link, sign up, and they're going to get wisdom, inspiration, and motivation from Walt, from Disney, every other Wednesday. Again, new content and free content. I have to give you a glowing endorsement for that as well. I remember the very early days when you were you were first working on it, and you sent me a link, and you're like, how does this look? And I was like, wow, this is going to be amazing. And it is, and I and I truly love, it's user-friendly. It's a gorgeous, colorful website. It's a wonderful commercial for my friend Jeff Barnes. But beyond all of that, it's a, it's a growing work in progress. I know that you do, because you travel all over the world and you're busy, 
busy all the time. I think you mentioned to me that most of your blog posts get written while you're on airplanes. Which so <laughs> <laughs> I always think about that. When I get my, e- my email inbox, which by the way, everybody, you just sign up on the website. It's totally free. Give Jeff your email and you'll get his blogs too, just like I do, in your email inbox. And you feel so special and privileged to get this stuff for free. Um, but he's writing a lot of it on the airplane. So every time I read it, I, I imagine Jeff on the airplane because he's probably written this on an airplane. But just amazes me how you have time to come up with this amazing content. And a lot of the blogs link back to previous blogs. So you you got to sign up. Don't waste another day if you haven't already um, looked up Jeff's website. And I love that you have your future events on there. Um, I just went to look and see if you're if you're going to be in town again. You know, like a couple days ago, I'm looking to see. So you get to see where Jeff is, where he's going to be speaking, because it could be a company or a city or something near you. So you want to check the website often. And I'm sure, too, that will be the place you'll want to go to get the two books, if you haven't already. All right, so winding it up, I just want to remind everybody that uh, Jeff Barnes will be in town. So this will be your chance to meet him. He hadn't, he didn't have plans to come to Florida anytime soon, but because of this event, he'll be here for like a brief 24 hours or so. So you don't want to miss this. It's going to be Walt Disney, Master of Dreamers, and it's playing at the Orlando Film Festival. Again, that pre-party is at 5 p.m., red carpet 6.30, the screening is at 8, and then they have an after party at 11 p.m. Sounds like a blast. You can go to their website to get tickets or you can also get them at the box office and uh, you won't want to miss this fantastic film October 17th. I didn't realize it had been chosen to be like the first film in the Orlando Film Festival but I can definitely see why. You're so tied into Orlando and the history of, of Florida and all of that. They couldn't have picked a better film for this. It's so exciting. So we're looking forward to seeing you, Jeff, and definitely keep in touch with us and come back on the show when you have another event that you need to promote. And and thank you so much for your valuable time today. I really appreciate it. All right. Thanks to everyone. And um, we'll see you in Orlando. And I didn't think I'd ever have a chance to say this, but uh, come out on uh, October 17th and we'll see you on the red carpet. How about that? Yay! I'm going to tease you forever about being a famous actor. I know you just call it a contributor, (laughs) but you're always going to be an actor to me. That's so awesome. This is Krista Joy, founder of Living the Dream Podcast and DisneyWays.com. Thank you so much for tuning in to today's episode of Living the Dream Podcast. The music for our show is provided by Peter Alden Entertainment. Get your copy of Peter Alden's Kingdom Classics CD for your Disney tunes with a rock and roll twist at PeterAldenLive.com. We are an unofficial fan publication here at Living the Dream Podcast and not in any way affiliated with Walt Disney World, the Walt Disney World Company, or any of its affiliates or subsidiaries. All opinions stated within do not necessarily reflect the opinions of anyone else and certainly not the Walt Disney Company. Fate is kind. She brings to those who love the sweet fulfillment of their secret longing like a bolt out of the blue fate steps in and sees you through when you wish upon a star your dreams come